Ready, go! Four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. One. You are going to hear a conversation taking place in the airport. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. Welcome to Northwest Airlines. How can I help you today? I'd like to check in for the two o'clock flight to Nairobi. Okay. Oh, that flight has been moved back to two forty-five. Nothing major, just a weather delay that the plane experienced in Casablanca. May I have your name, please? Sure. It's Jim Harkness. Is that Harkness with two S's? Yep, and that's Jim with one M. Got it. Oh, I see you're connecting from Beijing. You sure are getting around. Yeah, I'm the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Beijing. I'm going to Nairobi for a conference on conservation planning. Fascinating. Will you have any luggage to check in? Yes, one bag, one carry-on. And one laptop. Fine. Put the bag on the scale, please. We are going to fill out customs forms before departure. Can I ask about the contents of your check-in bag? Sure. It's clothing, personal effects, some gifts, and a few books. Thanks. What seating would you prefer, aisle or window? I'd like a window seat, three rows back from those large TV screens, if possible. Let me see here. We have one four rows back. Is that okay? Yeah, I just hate being right in front of those screens. Then I have to watch every dumb movie that comes on. Now look at questions eight to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions eight to ten. I understand. Is that your carry-on? Yes, I bought it in India last year. It sure is a nice bag. Unfortunately, I think it's too big for the overhead storage compartment. Maximum dimensions for carry-on baggage is sixteen inches wide by ten inches high by twenty-one inches long. Oh. Well, it's okay with width and length, but it's twelve inches high. Are you sure that it won't fit? I've squeezed it in before. No, I'm sorry. You'll have to check it in with an agent prior to boarding. All right, it's no big deal. One final thing: Do you have any DVDs that you purchased in China? Yes, I have my own music CDs. Okay, that's fine. We're not allowed to transport DVDs. We're working on controlling copyright regulations imposed by WTO. Sure, I understand. Is that everything? Yes, it is. You have a wonderful flight now. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that. You're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions: the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, The little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sights tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get fifteen percent off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs ten dollars. But this year, it's just seven dollars. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red Explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists, and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid $1,500 for a stamp design and a further $800 if the committee actually decides to use the design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest. And because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about 2,000 ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens, for instance, King Henry VIII famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. 
If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the introduction about Tower Bridge and complete the summary. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Tower Bridge is located in one of the most interesting parts of London. On either top of the tower, you can get a bird's-eye view of the wonderful scenery all round Tower Bridge. On its south side are many tall old buildings. On its north side stands the Tower of London itself. But Tower Bridge. The first bridge over the Thames, as you travel to London from the sea, is the most famous of them all. Although they look the same age, the tower is almost a thousand years old, and Tower Bridge, which was built in the 1890s, is just over 100. Because of the tall ships up and down the Thames, it was proposed in 1850 that a bridge across the Thames near the tower was most necessary. However, the designers argued about the new bridge for about thirty years. They took so long because they had two big problems. One is that the new bridge must look like the old tower, and the other is that the bridge must not look like a modern bridge. They made it look like the old tower, so everyone was happy. Besides, the most surprising thing about Tower Bridge is that it opens in the middle. While big ships are going through to the Pool of London, if you're lucky enough to see the bridge with its two opening arms high in the air, you'll never forget it. The bridge took eight years to build and cost nine hundred thousand pounds—a lot of money in those days. But it was a wonderful success and became a famous tourist attraction in London on the day when the bridge was completed. A hundred years ago, the Thames was once London's busiest traffic route, so that the bridge opened at least twelve times a day. Today, big ships don't go so far up the Thames. Tower Bridge opens perhaps only twice a week, but the same wonderful machinery is still in good condition. Green, yellow, and red—the colourful wheels and engines—look smart and new. Not a hundred years old, they still lift the two heavy opening arms, each one thousand tons, leaving seventy meters for the ships to go through. And they still can open and close the bridge in one and a half minutes. Things are changing greatly now at Tower Bridge. The horses that used to help with pulling have gone, and so have the tugs, for they are no longer necessary. The walkways from one tower to the other at the top of the bridge were closed years ago because so many people jumped off them into the Thames, which is said to open again soon. In addition, the beautiful wheels will be part of a special exhibition for the public to visit.
There'll be a restaurant in one of the towers and a pub in the other. But whatever happens in its exciting future, Tower Bridge will always mean London. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.